What's up, everybody? My name is Aaron Wexler, and welcome to another episode of Within the Game. Let's go. Within the Game is all about how to treat your craft and your life like a game so you can stay inspired, have more fun, and ultimately find fulfillment both in and out of your game. And thank you to the listeners. I appreciate all you guys. And if you would like to support the show, a great way to do that is to grab a copy of my book, The Inspired Athlete, as well as share this episode with anyone you think would benefit from it. Also, if you could give the channel a like and subscribe, all those things really do help. And today's guest, I'm super fired up for you, man. Today's guest is the one and only Dr. Tom Walters. Doctor, thanks so much for being here, man. Thanks, Aaron, man. Excited to be here. We were chatting a little bit beforehand and, uh, man, excited about your book and everything you're doing, what this podcast is about. And uh, yeah, man, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. I'm going to, I'm excited about your book too, which I have right here, Rehab Science, which we'll get into in a bit. Um, Doctor, you are a movement practitioner, practitioner expert with a martial arts and gymnastics background. Dr. Tom Walters is a PT and CSCS whose mission is to help people understand and alleviate their pain while achieving more movement control with their bodies. I love that. Uh, you have expertise as a traveling PT for Circus Olay and has a doctorate in rehabilitation science and is now the CEO of Rehab Science as well as the author of this new book, Rehab Science. You, got a, you have a great YouTube channel and a thriving social media presence at Rehab Science. I'll link all that stuff below. Thanks again for being here, doctor. And we're going to just jump right in because, you know, one of the first things I love to ask my guests are, well, is this question about the idea of inspired living. What does that mean to you, the idea of inspired living? Yeah, that's a great, uh, I love the, just the name of it right off the bat. And thank you for the amazing intro. Um, hmm. Inspired living, you know, I think to me, it's this sort of, um, you know, it's a, it's something it's like, I've never heard that before, that phrase, those two words put together, inspired living, but it actually kind of communicates to you immediately, you know, and I think probably because I feel lucky and fortunate to be in a space right now in life where I feel really inspired just in everything I'm doing, the work feels very meaningful. And I think, uh, you know, my just no personal life too, you know, I'm, you know, there are of course challenges and challenges help you grow in different ways. I, you know, so, but I think that idea inspired living to me almost feels like this sort of almost gut level intuitive sort of emotion that just comes out of somewhere that you don't even really, you can't even really explain sometimes, but it, it drives you in all of the different aspects of living, you know, I think whether that's professional or personal, or whatever it is, you just feel inspired to be better and grow. And yeah, I think that's, that's where, that, what it means to me, man, dude, I love that answer. And it's so great for me to, to hear the answers of everyone that comes on the show. But I love that, that it kind of like just made you think for a second. Cause like, for me, like, that's what it's all about right? That's what this existence is all about is trying to get to that feeling more and, and staying on the path to that. Because we're not always on, we're not always there, right? But we can stay on the pathway to that place. I think that's great. And, and that's why you inspire me, man, because of your work to help get the body in alignment, right? We were talking about that before, right? Which is like, you know, um, alleviating pain, addressing pain. But a big part of inspired living for me as an athlete is to feel good, right? In my body, right? Like there's nothing better than feeling good. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And there are so many, um, you know, just like we were talking about before, you know, being inspired kind of from there's, there's lots of different perspectives and, you know, from kind of like your social aspects to your physical body, to spiritual kind of elements, to how you think and, you know, having all those things in alignment are, you know, you have to consider all of them. And that's what we think about when we look at pain and injury, people are complicated. And if you're going to inspire someone, you have to think about all of those aspects, you know, for so long, you know, just to look at physical therapy and exercise and things like that, right, there's all kinds of education out there meant to inspire people. But we know that a lot of times that information by itself isn't enough to inspire people. Right. You know, there's so much information about everything. But so you've got to peel back those layers. And each person is different. And you have to figure out what motivates them and what inspires them to be better in their own life. And I think that's something we look at a lot in pain and injury and as trainers and different things like what, what kind of 
factors or what narratives kind of speak to this person and inspire them to get moving? So let's let's jump right into pain, right? This is kind of uh, kind of your your wheelhouse, I'd say. And you know, I I think that most people are living in some sort of pain, right? Whether it's chronic, acute, um, you know, it, whether it's even physical or emotional, right? There's some sort of pain that we all deal with almost on a daily basis. I was hoping you could maybe go through the different types or archetypes of pain and how we start to address them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I agree with you. I think uh, the majority of people, even if we look at the stats and the physical body and different types of pain, a huge percentage of people are in pain or will have pain at some point. And like you said, you know, there's also psychological pain and emotional suffering and things like that, that can feed into how our physical body feels. You meet a lot of people who, especially when you start looking at chronic pain, where their, their pain is their physical pain, their body is actually more driven by their thoughts and emotions. And so, you know, we have to consider all those different areas. But when we look at kind of pain from a physical therapy standpoint in the physical body, we break it down into kind of three main ones. And one would be sort of um, what we call mechanical or nociceptive pain, which is what most people think of when they have pain in their physical body, like the, which would be like you injured a tissue, like you sprained your ankle, something like that, or you strained your back, you know, and now you have pain because of it. So those things you can identify a pretty obvious physical thing that happened in the body, that pain is a little more easy to understand. It's easy to turn on and off. You know, it's like, oh, it hurts when I, you know, do a squat. And then if I'm not squatting, it doesn't hurt. Or if I turn my ankle this way, it hurts. If I stop turning it that way, it stops hurting. So it's more predictable. It has those clear on off positions. We have pain like that. There's then um, what's called neuropathic pain, which is pain of your nervous system. So that will be things like sciatica, carpal tunnel syndrome. If you've ever hit your yeah. funny bone, you know, when you hit, yeah. you bonk your elbow, that is an acute neuropathic pain. You bonk your ulnar nerve and it shoots tingles down to your pinky finger and ring finger. And so that's the second type. And then the third type is chronic, which we often now call persistent pain. The word chronic has sort of a negative meaning to it. A lot of people, when they hear that, they think, oh, I'm never going to get better. So now we try to use the term persistent, which just means a pain that stayed around longer and the characteristics of it change a little bit. It's a little different than that mechanical pain. Sometimes it's less predictable. It can kind of come out and suddenly um, it doesn't have really clear mechanical on and off type triggers. So those are, and you can find others out there. And even within chronic pain, there's all different types and we cover them in the book. You know, I mean, there's a post-cancer chronic pain. There's like cr chronic headache type pain. Um, there's all different types of chronic pain. So, but those are kind of the three big ones. Yeah. Um, does, is pain the first kind of alert that your body gives your brain that something's wrong? No. Uh -uh. Yeah. We used to think that we used to think back in the day, pain was thought of as this thing that came from your body. So you would burn your hand or step on something sharp and you'd have a pain, you'd have a pain signal, which would go up to your brain and say, Hey, there's pain right here. And so in that way, we did think about it as this first alert, but now the research has really changed. And we know now that even though you can obviously feel pain, in your physical body, uh, it, it doesn't start as a pain message. It starts as what we call now danger messages. So you have specialized nerve endings called nociceptors that are basically high threshold nerve endings. They're meant to just detect danger. Hmm. So they require a stronger stimulus, you know? So if you imagine, I always tell people like, if you imagine putting pressure on your finger, if you gradually increase pressure, it's just pressure in the beginning, right? It's just a, it's just a sensory sensation. But as you increase pressure more and more and more, you'll hit a certain point where you will activate nociceptors and then you'll start to send danger messages to your brain. And then what's really interesting about pain is that they've basically found the research now that 100% of the time, pain is an experience. It's an emergent property of your brain. So your brain decides to output pain when it thinks there's an actual or potential, there's actual or potential damage to your body. So, but that's not to say sometimes people hear that and they think we're saying pain is comes from your head that's in your head. That's not what we're saying. We're not saying pain's made up. Pain is totally valid and a real thing. It's just that it's an, it's an emergent property of your brain. So your brain sends it out. So 
Hmm. And the reason that happens is your brain has to think about a lot of factors to determine whether or not outputting pain is appropriate. So it's not just the danger signals. That's one input. But other inputs are vision, hearing, your thoughts and emotions, how stressed you are at that moment in life. You know, there's a lot of factors that go into and your brain's going to look at all those. And if it decides pain is valuable to keep you alive, then it will output pain. But there are lots of times where the brain gets those danger messages and doesn't output pain because maybe you're in a situation where having pain might cause you to limp and that would be bad for that situation. You need to get out of there. Like maybe a car is about to hit you or you're, I, I'm big into MMA, like maybe you're an MMA fighter and you're in a round and you've got a broken toe, but you need to be able to keep going. It's important to you to keep going. Having pain in that moment would interfere with your movement and, you know, could jeopardize the outcome of that match. So there's a lot of examples. We see lots from war, soldiers, different situations where people are in really kind of important, meaningful situations. And even though they have something really serious that's happened to their body, where of course there's these danger messages flooding their brain, they don't experience pain. Mm. Interesting. Um, let's get right into some advice for someone listening to this. Someone with persistent pain, mm -hmm. right? Or I, yeah, chronic pain is, is is what came to my mind. But yeah, I li actually I like that word persistent pain. Mm -hmm. What's the best advice for someone dealing with pain on a day-to-day -day basis who's looking or seeking a way to live pain-free? Yeah. Yeah. There are so many factors that go into pain, especially when you get into persistent pain. Acute pain, mechanical pain is much easier to treat. You know, the medical right. system's pretty good at that. Physical therapy is pretty good at it. When you get into persistent pain states, you know, I think really the best advice is for people to think about it. You know, you want to start thinking about start maybe even taking a journal. A lot of times a lot of people use a journal with this, but what are the things that we call them aggravating factors? What are the things that I notice that aggravate my pain? It could be lots of things. It could be different movements or things you do out the day. Maybe it's I sit for long periods and that triggers it. Or when I bend over, it triggers my pain. Or when I have to walk a certain distance, it triggers it. It could be movement system, things like that. It could be that I have worse pain when I eat certain foods. Or when I don't sleep enough, I notice, oh, my back pain hurts more. I didn't sleep a lot last night. Or I didn't sleep that well. Or I drank some alcohol the day before and didn't sleep well. Or I was, I'm really stressed. Like I have to speak at this thing coming up. Or I have something, a difficult relationship going on right now. And it's stressful. And I notice now my pain has flared up. So you really have to start paying attention. Life is hard because there's lots of variables. It's not a clear cut experiment. So there's all these variables. So you really, I really try to encourage people. I'm always kind of planting seeds, helping people think about these are all these different factors we know can sensitize the nervous system. So you've got to kind of try to think about when you're having pain, try to pay attention to what was going on in that time period that maybe contributed to it. Because right. persistent pain for sure can be related to the tissues of your body, but it can also be related to a lot of other things. Yeah, so I think so many things, right? Yeah, right. It's like, think about that stuff. And then the big thing is, you know, in the physical body, a lot of people who have persistent pain are triggered by movement things, right? They're triggered by certain postures or certain movements. So after you kind of start to think about what are all the factors that can be involved, the next thing is if it is triggered by movement things, then we try to implement graded exposure like a psychologist would for anxiety or depression. So this just means introduce small doses of that thing that causes your pain to flare up. And over time, your nervous system will desensitize. That's the positive aspect of neuroplasticity is that if you, if you expose your system to smaller, increasing, increasingly small doses of stress, it will desensitize. So say your back hurts every time you bend over, even if it's just like to put on your socks or something, yeah. right? Like say that causes a major flare up and back pain. Well, then you can think about, okay, so my back hurts when I round it and pick things up. How can I gradually expose my system to that kind of stress in small doses? So we might do things where we have people lay on their back and pull one knee up to their chest, alternate pulling their knees to their chest or pulling both knees up to their chest, which is creating the same physical movement in the body. It creates lumbar flexion, but it's changing the context of the movement. And sometimes that can help provide kind of a novel input to the nervous system that's less threatening and help to desensitize the system. So it's mm. kind of starting to think about how can I introduce little pieces of stress and have a plan to make my system less sensitive. Mm. I love that. I love having a plan. And, you know, this conversation makes me think back to my experience, you know, right? Because and, and I want to tie in this idea of inspiration, too, because I feel like 
I'll just tell you my experience. You know, I, I've had two knee surgeries, both medial meniscus, but the the second one, the second time I did it, I it just deflated me. And I feel like a, I think that's very relatable to a lot of athletes who go through a, an injury where it's like, man, you just you you this inspiration just gets sucked out of you because you're just like, oh, again, you know, if you have a, a you know if you have a, a second injury like I did, um, but you know, I. I heard you on another podcast talking about how all your your mission now is to like empower people to be their own PT, to learn about how to be the own master of your own body, right? Because I think what happens is when we get injured, it it creates this response of like, first, you get that deflated in my experience, but then you go seek, right? You seek out, you seek help, you seek a doctor, a PT, whoever it may be. And, you know, they're they're awesome they're amazing people but i also think that there's a big value in just like learning okay this is what happened how can i prevent this from happening again i was hoping you could talk a little bit about like empowerment right especially dealing with pain or an injury how do you take that and instead of getting too deflated right like empower yourself to learn about your body and be your own pt yeah. Well, you're exactly right. You know, the psychological impact of injuries is huge. I mean, there's so much more research on this now and we see it a lot. ACL tears are a good example where people it's deflating alone just to have the first ACL tear, but then people who have second and third, I've had athletes before who had their third ACL tear and it's, you know, the impact of that, the person, you know, the depression that's associated with it, the fear of re-injury, you know, yeah. those things can be really debilitating to people. So, you know, it is, it's like, you kind of are grieving and you go through stages of grief. And then, like I said, you hit a point, I think where people are like, okay, I'm ready to take this challenge on again. And, you know, I think the, one of the most empowering things when it comes to injuries and pain in the body is that if we look at the research on different interventions to help with these things, the two things that have the best evidence are education and exercise, yeah. right? So those you can do on your own. We refer to them as active interventions because the person who has the injury or the pain participates in it versus a passive intervention. It's like where you go lay on a table and somebody massages you or they adjust you or do yeah. acupuncture. Those are all passive and those do have short term. Those can help in the short term with pain and things, but no, not really past, you know, like they're like a six week type thing. And then after that, you're really looking at mobility exercises, strength exercises, exercises and strategies that can help reduce discomfort and pain. And those are all things that you have control over and can do on your own. And, you know, if you go on social media and you look out there, you're trying to right? there's a lot of information these days. And yeah. we talk about this a lot, like trying to filter through and figure out what to do can be really tricky if you don't have a background in a certain area. And I think sometimes the easiest way to think about pain and injuries, you kind of boil it down to two steps. It's like, first, just think about desensitizing your system, trying to calm down pain. And we usually do that with things like self-massage kind of techniques. It might be with a ball or a foam roller. You just kind of work on kind of doing some self-mobilization and then mobility type drills, easy mobility yeah. drills. Like you're just moving the joint. Like say you hurt your knee, you could just sit on the ground and kind of we do hill slides. Like you just slide your knee in and out. Just work on, like you had a meniscus injury. We do that a lot with meniscus tears. Like you start doing heel slides. Like yeah. how many degrees can I bend my knee? Can I get it all the way straight? How far can I bend it? I'm just going to, this is easy and simple. I'm just going to work on moving this thing as far as it'll let me and it will get better over time. That's yeah. kind of the first step. So it's like, let's calm things down, work a little bit on mobility. The second step really is to increase the capacity of your system and to make it more resilient. And that's really with resistance training, resistance training, every rehab program should eventually focus on resistance training. You know, once your system is kind of calmed down, your mobility is looking good. The thing that has the best evidence for reducing the risk of future injuries is strength training. If yeah. you get stronger, think, I mean, think about your musculoskeletal system is basically a system of links and levers, you know? And so it's very mechanical in a sense, obviously the nervous system part, it's more complex than just a mechanical system, but when you, there is a part of it that's very mechanical. And if you can make with string training, you can increase the capacity and of your tendons, your muscles, your ligaments, your bone changes, your cartilage tissues change like meniscus and labrum in your shoulder and hip. So resistance training at the end of the day is kind of where you want to end up. That's going to make you more resilient. And, you know, it's never a hundred percent injury prevention. As we know, you could trip off a curb. You could be doing everything right and sprain your ankle and not see something coming, right. but right. Doing those types of exercises will greatly reduce injury risk. Hey everyone, thanks so much for being a fan of the show. I really appreciate your support. 
And if you'd like to further support the podcast, please grab a copy of my book, The Inspired Athlete. Uh, The Inspired Athlete is all about my personal growth journey, my athletic journey, my spiritual journey, all combined into one. And really the idea is that um, the energy of the inspired athlete is within us all, and it's up to us to evoke that. And uh, whether you consider yourself an athlete or a competitor or not, it's my belief that the energy of the inspired athlete is within us. Even if you just decide to take a deep breath and just move your body, that's the inspired athlete. So it would mean a lot if you could help support the book project as well as the podcast by grabbing a copy, uh, links to the Amazon uh, paperback version as well as the Audible um, audiobook version are listed below in the description. Thank you very much for your support. Stay inspired, y'all. That's awesome. Um, let's talk about this idea of healing, right? I feel like you're a healer. Yeah, like just just to be so passionate about this idea of PT and pain management, um, it's all it's all getting back to health, right? And and this idea of healing. And please correct me if I'm wrong when I say this, but my belief is that the body, the body wants to breathe, move, and heal. If I were to break it down to like three things, like that's what it wants to do. That's what my body wants to do. You know, and 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 that's like on an everyday basis. I want to, I want like this big breath of fresh air. I want to feel my lungs expand and contract. I want to move. I want to move like in a fluid way, in a, in a you know, an athletic way. However, it wants to do it. I I want to like let my body move. And then at the end of the day, also, it wants to recover. It wants to heal. Um, talk about healing as it applies to the body, and and then really talk about healing on a general level, like what even is healing? Yeah, for sure. No, I agree with those things. Those are your body, your nervous system. You know, we are, I think in a lot of ways, just built to kind of do those things. And when people aren't integrating things like just getting sunlight, breathing, like moving, then it interferes with this natural healing process that like you said, our body is it really has this amazing system to be able to help us heal and recover and rebuild tissues. And But when you get those other things wrong, you're not doing enough of them too much. It can go either way. There's kind of a, there's kind of a sweet spot, I think with stress. And when you have that dialed in, then your body adapts positively. If it's not dialed in, then it adapts negatively. And, um, you know, when you look at healing, it generally goes through three stages and this is kind of, we talk about, I I talk about this in the book and the programs are, are designed to be in three phases to kind of mimic the three phases of healing. But a lot of this comes actually from skin injuries um, and looking at somebody has like a cut on their skin. But basically what will happen is that the first stage is inflammation. And right, a lot of people are familiar with that. That's why ice has kind of gone out the window a little bit on soft tissue injuries. We're not recommending it so much anymore because ice has been shown to delay that inflammatory response and delay healing. Mm, so interesting. Um, more and more of the research in the kind of sports medicine world is moving away from this old rice, you know, it's rest, ice, compression, elevation. So we've ice has come out of that. And, you know, so you have this inflammatory phase, which typically lasts a few days, you know, it's usually like in the two to three day window. And then people go into a fibroblastic or kind of maturation phase where their um, body is starting to clear kind of damaged tissue and then start rebuilding um, the damaged tissue. And so the damaged structures and that you know, these things vary depending on the the grade of the injury. You know, if you sure. strain a muscle or, um, you know, if you uh, tear a ligament, there will be, you know, usually three grades depending on, you know, just mild to like you fully ruptured. Of course, that's going to affect the healing time. But that second stage of healing is usually thought to be about three weeks. And then after that, you go into remodeling and remodeling is really where, for many months, you know, even in ligaments, sometimes there's evidence of remodeling up to two years. So tissues that have a lower blood supply will remodel for a long time. And that is really bringing the structure back to close to kind of like what it was originally. So Hmm. healing goes on for a long time. And obviously pain doesn't usually last that long. So sometimes you have to be kind of careful because pain symptoms with mechanical issues will often resolve, but the tissue isn't fully at its maximum potential yet. And, you know, we, coming back to ACLs, we would see this after ACL reconstructions, people go have surgery, you know, go see the surgeon, have their ACL reconstruction done. 
their pain maybe after a couple of months or something isn't that bad. And they feel like it can sort of tempt you into doing more than the tissue is actually ready for. And so you would see, you know, in the ACL research, for example, they don't want people to return to sport before nine months because we see that any time before nine months, the injury risk goes up just because that graft, that ligament hasn't had enough time to remodel and, and for the capacity of that structure to really heal. Hmm. But it's all these things, you know, like movement's a huge part of healing. When you're looking at pain, breathing, I have a good friend, Jill Miller, who has this great um, book called Body by Breath. That's kind of all about breath and how breathing can influence, you know, when you think about sympathetic versus parasympathetic states and how that can affect pain, Um, you know, and sleep, right? Like sleep and nutrition, those things are so huge. Sleep is when most of our healing goes on. Right. And so that's why you need that seven to nine hours. And most Americans are below that and uh, also are influencing their sleep with things like alcohol and things that just really, I think at the end of the day, a lot of times, if you just made sleep the big priority, it would solve a lot of healing issues. And then, you know, there's things like nutrition where you think about how much protein am I getting? How many calories? Like I've got to have those building blocks for my tissue. Most of our tissues are protein based. So, you know, there's, there, it, See, so you can get talking and make it sound really complicated, <laughs> yeah. but uh, it really, you can boil it down to just a few things to help people kind of think about. And I think when it comes to healing, sleep is probably the top one. How many hours of sleep should we be getting? You know, they say it obviously varies person to person. I listen to some of the sleep researchers, researchers, and I think we'll learn a lot more, like a lot of things where you probably at some point you could do genetic testing and kind of figure out what your system needs. But, you know, the recommendation now is for adults in that seven to nine hour range. I tend to be kind of closer to the nine hour. It seems like somewhere between eight to nine. If I get that range, I um, talk about inspired living. I am much more inspired when I have had enough sleep. And my body just heals better. Yeah, me, you and me both. Um, are there any guidelines like before we drift off this drift off to sleep? Because I I'm very guilty of being on my phone mm-hmm. before, and I'm sure a lot of people are or in the electronics watching a screen. Is that does that affect sleep at all? Yeah, I mean, I know they talk about that. It does seem like to me that those really like some of the light things uh, like the i remember we're talking about the blue light from the phone that some of you know kind of trying to avoid that but i'm the same as you i look at my phone i'm usually writing posts at night before i go to bed (laughs) so just when i do it my kids go to bed and i honestly i think you know again this varies person to person but i think the influence of that is probably not as strong as we used to think and to me it's probably more about just having a routine and i think the potentially detrimental thing of a phone is if you're looking at things that are stressful yeah before you go to sleep because like for me i'll watch a lot of comedy sometimes like all because we know laughter helps pain we have studies Mm. on persistent pain and i really like theo von stuff and uh i'll watch some of that and man it i fall asleep so good when i've had a little bit of like i've just laughed a little and it's like gotten rid of whatever stresses might have been on my mind so and that's coming from a screen and from my phone so Dude, a hundred percent. That really helps me too. Like, even if it's just, you know, like silly, silly stuff that just kind of makes you light at the end of the day, rather than like a, like a, a war movie or like, um, you know, some sort of like crazy action where it's like too much like guns and stuff like that. I don't like that. It actually messes up my sleep. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I have to ask you about ice baths. You mentioned mm. ice. Um, I, really like ice baths it, it, i feel great and i kind of they're kind of like trending right now it's like mm-hmm. a lot of people are doing the ice bath thing yeah. um can you you mentioned that we're not really supposed to do r-i-c-e anymore talk about ice baths though in in terms of not just healing but like overall health yeah no i think there's a lot of other reasons um you know if you just had a straight soft tissue injury you know there's probably things you'd prioritize before you did something like an ice bath and again maybe if it's something closer to the surface and could maybe the ice could impact the speed it with, you know, how fast that heals. Maybe that's something to think about, but there's a lot of other reasons I think to consider ice baths. And we even talked about them in the book and the research on it. Like you'll see ice positive benefits of ice baths um, after strenuous workouts, okay. you know, and I think that's why you see so many athletes do them, but like, you'll see perceptions of fatigue go down um, of soreness, things like okay. that. So I think 
you know, there's something, is it just your nervous system that it's influencing? Cause right. there's a lot of talk of ice baths now with um, different kind of mental health kind of ideas and concepts yeah. like with anxiety and just sort of, I mean, I've got, I'm in California, we're both in California, you know, I've got patients who go out and do these, have little communities where they go out and do like cold water plunges in the Pacific. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like they feel in there's a, right. There's a lot of factors that there's a community and, but it's got that cold element. And I think they really feel like for their kind of mental health and just how they feel it is helpful. So I think there's other aspects. It's not something I do a lot right now, only because I just don't have easy access to it, you know, mm -hmm. but I mm -hmm. think I would be, um, Definitely, it would be something I admit into trying. I do think the other thing, if people are thinking about thermal stressors, there's a lot of research for sauna. And yeah, sauna has right. a lot, you know, for cardiovascular, your cardiovascular system and for um, limiting atrophy in your physical body. Say you had an injury and you were immobilized, like say you're putting a brace, sauna through these heat shock proteins can help to reduce the atrophy that might happen there. So I probably, you know, I think there's a place for both of them. Um, I just have easier access to sauna. And so there's people can go both directions. I think when you're thinking about healing and maybe some of these benefits there to me, they're both a thermal stress. And often we don't have thermal stresses anymore because we live in air conditioned buildings and, you know, there's heating and there's just, we're never really, I think our ancestors were exposed to the elements a little more yeah. and that probably that 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 altered some things in our genetics and probably helped in some ways in terms of health and longevity huge thank you to new sponsor of the show chico bag chico bag is your eco-friendly travel pack and shopping companion i actually have my travel pack right here i use it almost every day and i love it love it for little day trips or um, going to the grocery store it replaces hundreds of single-use plastic bags and fits in your pocket or purse and with its stylish and durable design you can take it anywhere Chico Bag is a certified B Corp and donates 1% of sales to environmental causes. So join the Chico Bag revolution to reduce plastic waste and create a sustainable future. Visit ChicoBag.com and get 20% off your order as a Within the Game podcast listener using promo code Within the Game. Back to the show. I love the sauna. It, speaking of healing, like you can just feel the detox happening, right? You're just yeah. like, just sweat it all out, right? Yeah. Um, but I, 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 I'll briefly want to ask you before we get into uh, the next section about, like, I think it's called hydrotherapy, where you go back and forth, mm -hmm. hot, cold, hot, cold. For me, I feel amazing after I do that. Um, is there a scientific background on that that's like better than just one or the other? Yeah. The contrast baths you do contrast, hear. Yeah. yeah. You hear a lot about that, right? Like in the athletic training and sports medicine world, this kind of idea of going back and forth. I don't know mm -hmm. that I've encountered a lot of studies saying that it's better than just one or the other by itself. But I usually tell people this to me is one of those things that's so heavily influenced by your perception of how it feels, what it's doing to you. And I, sure. you know, cause I'll get a lot of patients that ask me these same types of questions. Should I ice or should I heat or should I do a contrast bath? And I really think at the end of the day, so much of it should be based on what you perceive. And, and if you have pain symptoms and how your pain symptoms respond to, because some people with pain, ice will make them worse or heat hmm. will make them feel worse, you know, or so I think it's kind of figuring that out, but that's right. That's another one that I think you hear so much about. I see so many athletes and different individuals doing these contrast baths just because they feel like it makes them feel better. Yeah. Even if, you know, I don't, a lot of these people aren't talking about it specific to pain or injury. It's just how they feel. And I, I honestly think there's so much, uh, so many different things in life that it's helpful to kind of base whether or not you choose to do something on how you feel from it. I sometimes mm -hmm. think that's one of the best indicators. Like we use that a lot in exercise, right? Like this idea of perceived exertion and kind of rating how hard people are working in exercise. And that often is a pretty useful kind of gauge for where people are at. And I think it also is helpful for, um, you know, I mean, it requires a certain amount of kind of body awareness, but I think it is helpful for also these types of other kind of strategies and interventions. Like how do I feel after it? Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, let's get into some specific sports injuries because a, a big chunk of my audience are athletes, right? Or former athletes. And most of us have something going on with our knees, hips and shoulders. So um, maybe just briefly, because, you know, for the audience listening in, in his book, in your book, man, you go through this extensively. I mean, this is like a Bible of, of, you know, rehab stuff, rehab science, PT stuff. 
But the way you present it in the book is so great because it's like easily consumed and digest digestible, which I love. And I think I was telling you before, I think your book's going to be industry uh, industry standard pretty soon. Um, but I, I was hoping you could just real brief go through those things, knees, hips and shoulders, uh, any tips that come to mind. Yeah. Yeah. No, for those joints, right. They are such big ones and, uh, they vary a little bit, um, based on how they're designed structurally, yeah. you know? So I think if you think about something like the shoulder, the shoulder is the most mobile joint in the body, you know? So sometimes it's even called a muscular joint, even though it's not really, it has a joint capsule and ligaments. So it's not a, but it is, it's controlled by your neuro, neuromuscular system so much. And it has such a wide range of mobility possible that it's a joint that because it's so mobile, most of the interventions that really help it are stability type exercises. So, you know, things where you're strengthening your rotator cuff and all these muscles that attach your, to your shoulder blade. So if you think about your shoulder joint, right, you've got like your long arm bone, your humerus. And that has a ball at the end of it. And that ball fits into a socket, which the socket is part of your shoulder blade. And your shoulder blade is kind of just floating on your rib cage. It's mm -hmm. really held mostly just by muscles. So it's really a pretty amazing joint. The dynamic stability we have in our shoulder joint is incredible. I mean, we need that wide range of motion so we can reach for things and put our hand in space to a lot of times bring like to eat, do different things, grab different things. But it's fascinating. I mean, how much it can move. And then when you think about how just coordinated your neuromuscular system has to be to, to control that movement. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when it comes to shoulder, a lot of the things, if people are having issues with their shoulder, a lot of the places we have people start are just rotator cuff strengthening right. exercises, right? You know, like simple kind of, yeah, internal and external rotation where your arms turning in out using a band, you could be laying on your side and using a dumbbell. Honestly, some of those exercises are the best place to start. If you have almost any kind of shoulder issue, if you've dislocated your shoulder, you just got pain. Um, you know, most conditions in the shoulder are going to be, are really going to be helped by stability kind of exercises like that neuromuscular control exercises. I mean, you get some that aren't like there's frozen shoulder, frozen shoulder is mm -hmm. sort of this weird one where people lose mobility in their shoulder. Usually people are a little older and, um, that is more mobility focused, but that's kind of the one exception in the shoulder joint. When you look at the hip and the knee, things wait, wait, change sorry. a little. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Let me, let me stop you right there. Just for yeah. the shoulder, just in case, um, someone's listening to this who doesn't have any shoulder pain when mm. you say all that should they still do internal external rotation like in a prehab kind of way i've heard you talk about prehab before yeah no i think it's a great idea the um in the book and you know like you said we uh broke it down by the whole body and so the shoulder is its own chapter each body region yeah. is its own chapter phase three of every program is all resistance training focus and like i said before you really want um whether it's a rehab program or a prehab program, it should really focus on resistance training. If it's rehab towards the end of rehab, if it's prehab, most of your focus should be on resistance training because that's going to help increase the capacity of tissues and, and reduce injury risk. And if you look at the shoulder, a lot of people will go and do things like pressing exercises, pulling exercise, like they'll do rows and bench press and shoulder press. And so they're that's great. They're, your shoulder moves in all these different planes of motion. So they're getting some of them. But I think the thing that does get skipped a lot is the transverse plane, which is that rotational plane of motion. Right. And so I really do think even if you don't have pain or injuries, training your rotator cuff and that rotational capacity of your shoulder is really important. Cool. So for cool. sure, I think yeah. taking those and just adding them in, you know, just building them into like your upper body program. Yeah. You know, if you're yeah. going to the gym and lifting upper body, just mix a couple of minutes. It doesn't have to be that it takes up a ton of time, but just mix a couple in. So totally. Yeah. I think that's huge. I just wanted um, to say that because yeah. I think that's overlooked quite a bit. Like even by me, like I, one of my, my shoulders feel great. I just, I focus on other areas, but I, I want to like remind myself, okay, let me just make sure my rotator cuff muscles are good on my delt. You know, like I want to, I want to keep, I don't want a uh, frozen shoulders, you know, what is it called? Frozen, frozen shoulder. shoulder. Yeah. 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 No, doesn't that sound fun. Um, yeah, that whole message, I'm glad you brought up because that's something we often are trying to, especially with a book, I'm because it is called Rehab Science. So people, you know, could be pigeonholed into this is just a rehab book. But really, so many of the movements that we do in rehab, we want people to continue with for life because they really have that other component to them where they will help protect you from injury. They're not just yeah. something where you're that you're doing them when you're injured or have pain. That's why so many people end up having repeat problems because they just as soon as they leave PT, they stop doing those things. Yeah. Totally. So, I, I know. And I, 
I want to just remind people rehab and prehab science, right? Exactly. Like exactly. It's, it's both, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, when you look at those other joints, the hip and knee are yeah. structured differently. The hip is interesting because it's a ball and socket like your shoulder, mm -hmm. but it just doesn't have the same mobility capabilities that your shoulder does. I mean, it still moves through a wide range of motion, but it just is naturally a more stable joint. The socket is way deeper. So even though it is a ball and socket, the ball sits really deep in the socket. And so if you think about, if you, you hear about lots of people who dislocate their shoulder, right? You don't hear about many people who dislocate their hip. Your hip, it takes huge forces. Usually it's like car accidents where people's knees hit the dashboard and it pops their hip out the back. So it has to be a high, high force. Um, so, you know, when it comes to the hip, oh, there is sort of a combination depending on what people have going on, but uh, there's... Can, for some people, there can be mobility exercises that might implement. But, you know, I think if you started anywhere with your hips and we're just looking at health, a lot of it would be glute, glute mm -hmm. focused training, mm -hmm. right? Like the yeah. glutes are such important force transducers for the, our whole lower body. And especially when we look at gluteus medius and gluteus minimus, these two muscles kind of on the outer side of your hip, they are involved in so many conditions in from the low back to hip pain, to ACL tears, different types of knee pain. They really help control that femur bone. And so, you know, e these are just exercises that a lot of people have probably seen, but things like single leg bridges, you know, you've seen probably exercises where we put a bander on your knees and do kind of squat walks side to side. We do one sometimes where we have people lay on their side and they lift their leg, side lying hip abduction, where they lift their leg up straight. Those are all really meant to kind of target your glutes and especially gluteus medius and minimus. Yeah. So awesome. The, yeah, there's, but you know, so many things like if you have a groin strain, of course you would do different exercises, but it, a lot of them are again, kind of strength based exercises, hip flexors, things like that. Doctor, I just, I just want to tell you, like I've had a groin issue for so many years. Like that's one of the areas that's been so frustrating going back to frustration and this whole, this whole topic we're talking about. I've had lingering pain in the groin because it's, you got to use your groin when you walk, when you sit, when you jump, when you move, like it's just there, you know, uh, real quick for the groin. Is there anything that comes to mind that you can suggest for someone who might be going through that as well, where it's like, yeah, I, okay. I do the foam rolling. I do the stretch. Like, what do I do with the groin? It just doesn't go away. Yep. Yeah. No, a lot of people, it is, like you said, it's one of those areas that you have to use every day. And uh, a lot of people, when they injure their groin, it's up really high where the tendon attaches on the pubic bone. So, yep. and that area, honestly, you know, um, you know, foam rolling or massaging your groin muscles, stretching them, those can have a place, but the thing that really helps uh, connective tissues like tendons is gradual resistance training. And I know I keep beating the drum on this on resistance training, but there are a number of people who have PhDs in tendon science. There are PTs who then went and did PhDs in tendon science. And if you look at the research on tendons, they really don't improve until you start loading them and strengthen them. And so for one example, for the groin, the exercise, so there's a progression you would take people through to gradually kind of get up to this exercise. But the one that's cited a lot nowadays, especially in soccer players who have had groin strains, um, is the Copenhagen adductor plank. I don't know if you've seen this one, but mm. it's um it's a plank, but what you do is you would be you'd lay on your side and you're working the top leg. The top leg goes up on an elevated surface like a chair or something. The bottom leg kind of slides in the hole underneath. And then what you do is you push down into the chair with the top leg so that your groin muscles lift your whole body up. So mm. you're doing a plank with your adductor muscles. And so you're essentially having to lift your body weight with your adductors. You can do it like on a TRX, different things like that. But um, that, like that, that exercise really loads and strengthens the groin muscles and their tendons. And it has been shown that when soccer players, for instance, who have had groin strains implement this a few times a week, I think it was three times a week, they had a huge, it was something like a 40% re um, reduction in the likelihood they had a second groin strain. Wow. And it can help with pain too. So if you just, you know, if you're maybe you didn't have like a real severe groin strain, but you just have pain there slowly loading it you know you start with isometrics all the time where you just hold the position for 30 to 45 seconds and then as that gets easier then you do full range repetitions but that's something i can send you that exercise but you just i would start awesome. trying that i'll definitely implement that uh yeah and then let's just go into knees briefly. knees yeah, yeah knees so knees are um your knees an interesting joint most people would kind of think oh my we have different categories of joints based on their architecture and how they move most people would think your elbow or your knee and your elbow are pretty similar they're both almost like hinge joints but your knee is interesting it does have this little bit of a rotation capability when it's bent 
So, you know, when people have injured their knees, like whether they've had a meniscus tear, an ACL tear, um, if they've had something in the joint or arthritis, then a lot of times we are working on that knee mobility initially. Like, can you straighten your knee all the way is really important. And then can you bend it to about 140 to 150 degrees? So you can always look at your other side and kind of measure, do I have that full mobility? And then after that, it is looking at, um, you know, in the knee, probably the thing you can do, the best thing you can do to keep your knees healthy is keep your quads strong Mm. because your quads are arguably the most important stabilizer of your knee. And it's where all the focus is uh, after these big injuries like ACL tears and, you know, meniscus tears and things like that. Your quads really stabilize your knee. And of course, you know, a lot of athletes have things like jumper's knee, um, which is a patellar tendon issue on the front of the knee, just down below the kneecap. This is why knees over toes guy has been so popular, right? He's very (laughs) quad focused and he's doing a lot of sort of quad exercises that involve the knees going over the toes, which for a long time, unfortunately in the rehab world, were sort of demonized. Right. And so he took these exercises that had been demonized, which was inappropriate and made them popular, you know? Mm-hmm. So like the lunge, for example, right? Exactly. Right, when he goes right. way past the toes, mm-hmm. he's got that real deep lunge. And for people who are looking to make their quads stronger and their patellar tendon stronger, that's really useful. Like you're right. really challenging those tissues. There are some people where it's not, it could exacerbate their symptoms. Like some people have pain behind their kneecap. It's called patellofemoral pain. And some of those people, if you put too much stress on their quads, it actually flares them up. So of course there's always nuance to these topics and like figuring out which exercise is actually best for the person. But you know, for the knee, a lot of it is going back to those glute, that glute strengthening, gluteus medius minimus, and then getting into strengthening your quads, your hamstrings and your calf. No, that's great. That's great. And if you guys, if uh, you're listening and you want more, check out the book, I'll link it below. Um, cause he goes into way more detail and your YouTube channel, by the way, which I want to plug, cause you got a great YouTube channel where you kind of go into the specifics of all these things, um, in a very great way. So I'll link that as well. I want to touch on posture because, uh, when we talk about hips, the first thing I was thinking about when you were talking about that is, man, we're like, people sit so much, you know, whether it's in Los Angeles, when we're in our car all the time where I live. Or even just like this, doing Zooms, you know, and behind the desk, and then we tend to slouch. Like, I catch myself all the time, even doing these Zooms. I'm like, all right, I got to, like, remember to, you know, get my posture right. I was hoping you could just, like, give some tips or, you know, talk about posture um, and how that relates to this whole picture. Posture is an interesting one, and it's actually changed in probably the last 10 years, a lot of how we think about it. But, um, you know... We don't so much kind of like demonized movements. We don't demonize postures so much anymore. Mm, okay. So the idea of good and bad posture, I'd really encourage people to not think that way as much anymore because it's not that simple when it comes to pain. There are people with horrible posture who have no pain and there are people with perfect military posture that have horrible pain. So got it, got it. you really have to now more of the saying is your best posture is your next posture. So, which basically means don't be (laughs) static for too long. Like Uh, that's the detrimental thing is sitting too long, standing too long. Like your nerve, like we talked about before, movement is one of the best things you can do to help your body heal. And so many of these things, whether it's sitting in traffic or working a job is not movement, you're static. So movement helps with circulation, which helps get, you know, that blood flow getting to tissue, which then helps oxygen get to tissue and nutrients, glucose and things to get to your tissues. And that helps your nociceptors. You're more likely to start having danger messages sent to your brain when you're static all day, because you start becoming hypoxic and ischemic where you're not getting blood and oxygen to your tissues. So we really more than anything, try to encourage people when it's just pain and it's just your body weight, just think about moving more. Don't think so much like if you're sitting and it starts hurting. Well, yeah, shift your position. Your nervous system is pretty good about telling you when you should move. So just pay attention to it. Uh, 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 the heart tricky thing is that some people, they have to be in that position to work or in traffic. And so it's hard to, you know, to fully get out of it. Um, you know, so I recognize that's an issue. And so then there are things, you know, maybe you get a little lumbar support or you do different things to try and change your position, just like find what alleviates your symptoms and try to do more of that. Don't make it super complicated. Get rid of this idea of good and bad posture. Okay. Now, If you start putting load on your system, then posture does become a little more relevant. Like where are you putting, like you have a barbell on your back with 150 pounds and you're doing deadlifts, then you do want to start thinking about kind of posture and biomechanics and alignment a little more because there's more tissue stress. And so 
but even in that world, if you look at like uh, the strongest man competitors, right? A lot of times they're going into really rounded low back postures and lifting 400 or 500 pounds. And so, you know, you'd hear some trainers say, oh, that's, you don't want to round your back ever when you deadlift or squat because it can increase your risk of injury. And it's an, it's a thing where I think it's just, it's more complex because we see people, it basically boils down to what is your system's capacity? So your musculoskeletal system has an amazing ability to adapt. It's called Wolf's law. When you put load on it, your bones become denser, your muscles become stronger. Even the intervertebral discs in your back change in weightlifters. They're different than non weightlifters. So if you do that in gradual doses with progressive overload, you gradually add weight to the barbell. You don't do something that your system's not ready for. You try not try to minimize those things. Your tissues will change. And then, you know, you can do things differently that might look like you might end up being safe in something that looks like technically bad posture. You know, so like if you take a deadlift, for example, they've actually done research on this. Um, they put bone pins in and it, when people deadlift and you tell them to keep their back perfectly straight, it still flexes. You can't stop your lumbar spine from flexing, even though a lot of people believe you can. But, you know, so if you take someone from a posture standpoint and they're learning, they're a newbie, like new to the gym and learning to deadlift, well, of course, start them with really lightweight and probably encourage them to stay close to a neutral spinal position. Like you probably, it probably wouldn't make sense in terms of minimizing risk to put really not put a lot of weight on the barbell, obviously, but also probably not have them just go ahead and start like rounding. You just have to think more about if I've got extra load that's past their body weight and they're doing something new to their system, I've just got to introduce stress in gradual, in a gradual fashion. And, mm, okay, you know, ACL tears are another example, right? Like when people, they're often associated with the knee caving in when like a soccer player, someone's running and cutting across the field. So technically that is kind of a posture thing, right? Cause it's like their knees caving into valgus, a valgus position and they're, but, but it's different. If you just went and did that, you were just walking or jogging and put your knee in that position. It's not dangerous, but if you're sprinting and there's high acceleration that increases the force on the tissue. And so as soon as force goes up on your tissue, you've got to think about posture, which could be more weight or you're moving faster. I think what I'm hearing you say is like, just be aware of your body. Be aware of your body at all times. Cause you know, like when I went through my second injury, um, knee surgery, I, I got the NASM, um, CPT, you know, the, the certified personal trainer, um, certification through NASM and, and that, education really helped me understand my body. And I think that that should be like, we should have learned that in school. Like that should be like compulsory learning for all human beings. We should learn about our anatomy, the kinetic, specifically the kinetic chain, how everything works, you know? And uh, that's why sometimes um, injuries can be a blessing in disguise, right? Because it kind of almost forces you to like, look at your body and like really understand it. You know, yep. we um, talk about this in the book, pain and injuries are a major teacher. And if yeah. you can, it, it sucks, right? It sucks to be, have pain and be injured. And I see people every day that are depressed because they are feeling down because they can't do the things they want to do. And I felt that way. I've had a lot of injuries and in sports and growing up and things. And, you know, but it can really be a teacher to help you become more aware of what's happening in your life and um, just about your body and how well you move. And I think I feel so grateful. I didn't recognize it when I was in high school and things, but because I grew up in martial arts and gymnastics, I gained a lot of body awareness that I didn't yeah. appreciate at the time. But right. now as a physical therapist, I see how valuable that was because I spent all this time learning to move well before I put a lot of load and challenged my system with more weight, you know? So I, I knew how to kind of control my body and just because it innately happens in those sports. But I think that's a great thing for people. I think a lot of people who go through rehab, because we do these exercises that make them really think about, we call it sensory motor control, but how can your nerves get, how can you improve that ability of your nervous system to sense where you are in space and create the appropriate motor program so that you can control your body. And it's so important to develop quality movement before you start adding weight to it. Sure. Absolutely. Um, doctor, I know we only have a few minutes left, but I, I wanted to kind of shift the conversation slightly into this idea of EQ, emotional intelligence, because I, I do believe that it's a big part of this whole conversation, this picture that we're painting here with, you know, rehab or prehab or just health and well-being, right? That, that's really what it is. It's, it's well-being and, and being a, like going back to inspired living, like being balanced, 
right? Being a balanced human being, you know? Um, so I think EQ is a big part of that. And I want to, I want to kind of pick your brain about that. It, how does emotional intelligence play a role? I know we touched on this a little bit earlier, but maybe we could go into it a little bit more detail. This idea of emotional intelligence, how it plays a role and specifically in injuries, right? Mm -hmm. Cause that's kind of the theme of like what we're talking about here. Yeah. I think it's another really important area to be when I think about EQ to just kind of be aware of yourself and yeah. where you're at in your emotions, you know, and just kind of how you're processing things. Cause whether you have pain or you've had an injury, you're going through something that kind of requires a grieving process in a way. And I think if you're looking at pain, we know that the pain system can be sensitized by um, a person's emotions and their stress. So, you know, if you look at somebody who's really stressed out, there's more, their cortisol levels may be elevated and cortisol is known to sensitize your nervous system when it's elevated for long periods and can contribute to the development of persistent or chronic pain. So, you know, thinking about that kind of a, your EQ, not only, you know, so how are you functioning from that standpoint right now? And that are where, what are things you could do to help kind of your emotional health? And I think we talked about laughter before. Laughter mm -hmm. is often really helpful. Uh, social kind of connectedness is really helpful. And I think people during COVID really realized how, I'm a huge introvert, but I realized during COVID how much I need to be like going to the, even just going to the gym. I don't even really talk to anyone, but just the energy of other people helps me. Right. right. You know, and I think that all really ties into kind of your emotional health, what kind of, you know, the healthier relationships, just everything, the people around you, um, again, laughter, things like that. Um, and then when you get that, that's kind of, to me, kind of the pain side, how that factors into your pain system. When you're looking at injuries, if you've had an injury, of course, I also think it's really important to be aware of your emotions and to seek help out, health out. This is why we have sports psychologists and sure. things like this now, right? Like yeah. if you're an athlete and you've had an injury and you're struggling emotionally, find a sports psychologist, find someone like that, that can help you kind of figure, work your way through those emotions because they're natural to have when you've had an injury. It's scary. You wonder if you're going to be able to play again, or are you going to be able to play at the same level? Like what's going to happen? And those people can help you sort through that, which will not only help your healing, but it will also reduce the risk of future injury because we know that like fear, for instance, changes movement patterns. This is again, one that's been studied a lot in ACL. So people who mm -hmm. have increased fear after an ACL tear are more likely to tear that same ACL again or the other side. So mm -hmm. fear is a huge part of it and it's really natural. And there are batteries now in rehab when we're clearing people for return to sport testing. Not only do we look at things like how strong are they, how mobile, can they do different hopping tests, maybe if it's the lower body, but also looking at inventories on how much fear they have in their psychological wow. status. So that is wow. a part of return to sport testing. So if you have emotions that you feel like are detrimental to your recovery with a, with pain or an injury, I would definitely encourage people to like, go talk to a counselor or a therapist, or if you're an athlete, a sports psychologist, those people can really help you get that part figured out. Wow. That fear. I mean, that's, I got to ask you about trauma because there's this, there's this idea. It's almost kind of a spiritual concept, but there's a, there's a, an idea that we have trapped emotions in our body sometimes. Uh, there's a great book called The Emotion Code, um, written also by a doctor. I'd love to get your your take on this because the idea is that these trapped emotions that were never really addressed um, get trapped in our body in a physical way. They manifest in a physical way. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? Is that is there merit to that? I think there is. Yeah. I mean, the mechanism, the physiology of exactly how it works, I think is interesting. And I don't know, you know, I think we probably have a lot to learn on that, but I do think okay. early kind of trauma, I think that people, you know, when you're a kid and you're developing, you figure out just how to cope with things, whether they're wrong or right. You know, and I think I see patients who, you know, you don't, they obviously, most of the time people don't open up about this right away because they don't assume they should be talking to a physical therapist about that. But mm -hmm. physical therapy really is a lot of therapy. And as people are in it longer and you build that rapport, you'll hear more of their story and things that might have happened. I think a lot about this because my mom's a psychiatric nurse practitioner and my dad's a social worker. So mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time growing up in these kind of hearing, kind of thinking about these facets of people overall. And 
So as you kind of peel back some of those layers and you get to hear more people's stories, you'll a lot of times hear about these really challenging or stressful things that might have happened to them earlier in life. Um, and that could have been trauma from, you know, abuse from a parent or a caregiver. It could have been something traumatic, like a really severe car accident, or it could be somebody who was in the military, right, and has trauma from that experience. So, but I do think that in our neurological system, you do see where people manifest psychological suffering in different ways. And some people will manifest that in their physical body and it will be tied into a pain in their physical body. And you, you start to get hints of it as you work with people where maybe their body does, you can affect the pain with mechanical things, but it seems like there's more of a, a psychological or emotional kind of piece to it. And you really try to get deeper into that and figure out what in there, like, was there a trauma or there, maybe if there was a trauma, what were their thoughts or beliefs or emotions around that trauma? Right. And, you know, can you kind of dive deeper into that and figure out, help people, not only you figure out, but help them kind of identify those things. Cause a lot of times if somebody's had pain for a long time, when you're thinking about that graded exposure process, a lot of times it's not just the physical exercises and movements. If it's a pain in their physical body, sometimes it's also exposing them to kind of some of those thoughts and emotions and things that stir up their pain. Right, man. You have to confront it, right? You have to confront those things. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've had, yeah, I've had people before who bad car accidents, who have chronic neck pain, who anytime they're in a situation like that, even could just be, maybe it happened when they were a passenger in a car. Anytime they're a passenger, they're the passenger in a car, they experience more neck pain, things like that. And so you see where that trauma affects them. There's nothing that's changed about the stresses on their physical tissue, but those thoughts and emotions are doing something to their nervous system. So I don't understand how that completely works, but I definitely think your nervous, we've definitely seen the nervous system, the immune systems are really integrated together, almost are one system. And I think traumas that happen to people can be sort of stored almost like there's memories in there and those kind of manifest in your physical body. And some people won't really get all the way better until you address those things. That's amazing, right? Honestly, right? That's just amazing that 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 can actually be a thing. And um, yeah, even in the book, uh, uh, it's called The Emotion Code by um, by Dr. Nelson something. I can't remember his exact name, but um he talks about actually creating a heart wall for like if you have some sort of emotional p- trauma right you your your body will actually create a wall around your heart you know things like that to protect itself um and then you need to address that otherwise you you will go throughout your life with a wall around your heart you know um it's just really fascinating to me and i think what happened to me is that when i became aware of that and i'm still working on my awareness of that you know, it makes me want to like, address everything, right? Everything. Cause I don't want, I don't want to heart. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to have any trapped emotions, you know, like going back to the idea of this, this discussion, which is inspired living. I, I want to live like pain-free and like, you know, to the best of my ability with my, with my body. Right. I think that's, that should be everyone's goal. I feel. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with those things, like that heart wall one, you could see kind of, you could, hypothesize kind of explanations where it's like, you know, cause you do see a lot of people that um, have trauma and have kind of stress and anxiety where they have pain kind of around their mid back and kind of rib cage area and their low back and neck and things. And I, you know, you could see where maybe you've had a trauma and you've got that heart wall and you're kind of trying to protect yourself from, from uh, things that might get into your heart. And maybe by doing that, you tense all the muscles kind of around your thoracic spine right. and rib cage. Right. And maybe right. holding tension in those areas because so many people do kind of hold stress and related things in those areas. And I think, you know, that maybe that is one explanation for where you could have physical symptoms, you know, symptoms in your physical body related to something kind of emotional. Right. Wow. Um, I, again, I know we're kind of over time, but maybe this is a good, good time for a little bit of a spiritual kind of connection. How does spirit, how does like, the whole spiritual alignment, which I mm. talked to you a little bit before, how does mm-hmm. that play a role into, for you anyway, yeah. into this idea of, of physical alignment and overall health? Yeah, I think for me personally, um, 
I didn't grow up in a religious home, really. My parents kind of thought about it for a couple of years when I was in like junior high age, but I always had this sort of, again, kind of going back to that gut or intuitive kind of feeling of Mm -hmm. a connection to like God or something greater than me. And so as a kid, I would pray and do things like that before I went to bed. But I do, we know again, you know, if you taking any kind of major religions out of the picture, I think spirituality has a real place in kind of the alignment of your physical body and your mind. Um, cool. You know, you hear lots of people, you know, like we hear all the time about talks of kind of mind, body, spirit. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I think it's an element that I think that perspective you have when you feel like you are not alone and there's some meaning to all of this and what you're doing, it gives you hope. And I think hope it it changes um, how you think and it changes kind of your emotions around how you're thinking. And I think that when changes your mind and that changes your body. Yes. And so all those things work together. And I know for me personally, that's the case because a lot of people who have pain often don't have a lot of hope. And so I think spirituality, you know, this is why there are a lot of people who don't like to go to church and things, but church can be really powerful because of a community of a community of people who all believe something together. And, you know, there's positives and negatives of maybe what they believe that you could argue, but there is a positive element to just having a group of people doing something together that's spiritual. And I think that is, you know, I think people who are practicing like that for instance like a a faith kind of walk like that and going to church they experience those positive benefits and it gives them that bigger perspective on the challenges they have in their life and what life means and that helps them navigate you know even some of my siblings don't have much spirituality in their life and I see at times you know they kind of ebb and flow and I've seen where in time periods where they've been low in spirituality I've seen more hopelessness and how negative that is in everything in their life. Totally, man. Totally. And then, and it just, I just want to briefly say that that, that relates to my message, which is the whole idea of stay inspired, which, which is not like a lot of people are like, Oh, you mean you're just all fired up all the time? No, it's, it means that you have a connection, a spiritual connection Mm -hmm. to something bigger than yourself. That's the stay inspired. That's the, the inspired athlete, which I believe is within all of us. That's an energy, you know? So yeah, man, I I completely agree. And we can talk more and more about that. Maybe we'll save that for a part two sometime, but, um, I wanted to let you talk about your YouTube channel, your social media, your book, like go ahead and, and just talk about those things and, and promote yourself a little bit. (laughs) Well, thanks, man. Yeah, I, um, you know, I'm, I think I used to before I'm at rehab science on YouTube and Instagram. I'm on Facebook too, but mainly those other two. And really the mission with all, I think of it as a mission. When I started all this, you know, I was teaching at a college here. I taught at this Christian college for nine years and taught um, biomechanics and therapeutic exercise and pain science. And I was seeing patients at the same time. And I would have people come in with really harmful beliefs about their body and about pain. And it was, and sometimes those would come from the internet and sometimes from family members who didn't know any better. And sometimes, unfortunately, from practitioners who would Mm -hmm. use these harmful messages to keep patients coming back, to make them dependent on their care. And that was really frustrating to me. So a lot of the reason I got into social media was to think of it as like kind of a missions field and to put information out that pushed back against those narratives and also to just provide exercise. You know, at that point, I had been a PT for 10 years when I started on social media. And so I had most humans encounter a lot of the same problems and have the same questions. So I was just working to address those things and put these posts out that would help. And it's been amazing to see it grow over the seven years or whatever I've been doing this now, but it reaches people all around the world, you know, and there's people in the world who live in countries where there is no physical therapy. It isn't a profession or it's so far behind kind of current standards in the U S and other developed countries that they aren't getting really up-to-date information. And so, but it's amazing on, if you have a phone, you can look at something and really update yourself. And it's been so neat to see people look at posts and learn exercises and start doing them and get better. And I've heard so many cool stories over the years and the book, you know, is, is also rehab science, but it was really, you know, it's 500 pages. It's a big, it's like a textbook, but it's meant for the regular person and practitioners. Those were the two groups we wrote it for, but we wrote it with language that the person with no background on this, because I agree with you, 
I used to teach kinesiology. I think everyone should have some yeah. background in kinesiology. Like we all have a body. You should, yeah. it's, we, that should be a part of the education system. And so the book was really meant to kind of help people without a background, learn the first five chapters are on pain. The next five chapters are on injury, how they're similar, how they're different, all the science there. Um, and then the back half of the book is all rehab programs and helping people. It's basically meant to be a self-guided kind of resource that you can use to work through any condition throughout your body and serve, like we talked about before, as just if you aren't injured, you can use the things as as prehab. And uh, you know, all the programs are pictures of me doing the exercises. And it's essentially like if you went to PT and they gave you, I've got plantar fasciitis, here's a program. I've got sciatica, here's a program. You know, I've got neck pain, here's a program. So yeah, the book, the book is nice because you can of course get into way more nuance. Unfortunately, you know, social media people have a hard time finding a particular topic. You only have a certain word count you can use. You just can't yeah. go into the depth on things that help people fully navigate things. So the book was an opportunity to create this kind of one-stop resource that people can use for their whole body. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Cause it's really, it's really awesome. And, um, I'm enjoying mine, you know, there's, there's so much information in there, but it's, what's really cool about it is that it's got all these photos, you know, and, um, it just kind of walks you through exactly how to do things. So great job on the book and your social media is obviously on fire. I'm going to link all those things as well as your YouTube channel, but, Doctor, I just want to thank you for the time today. I think this was an amazing conversation and I, I do want to do a part two sometime. Maybe we can get a little bit more into that spiritual stuff, but I'm in, man. I'm um, in. Yeah. Cool. Thank thank you for the opportunity. Honestly, Aaron. Um, yeah. it's so fun when you, we were talking about before I, if podcasts are great, cause you meet so many interesting people and, uh, hearing what you're doing with your book and just the kind of motivation and mission behind this podcast jives with so much of the way I think and the way I think about um where i how i meet people who have pain and injuries so i think this was such a good two worlds kind of coming yeah. together so uh, totally. thanks man oh thank you and uh for the listeners everybody thanks for thanks for sticking with us uh this far please like subscribe and share and uh everybody stay inspired y'all peace and blessings